Welcome to CTL's Adolescent Literacy Model Strategy Scenario Video Series. In this series of videos, we look at a specific strategy from multiple perspectives, thinking about how we can apply it in our classroom to meet our teaching needs. Today's video is about the Double Entry Organizer, a robust strategy that lends itself to students interacting with content, whether it be from a text, as Jenny is going to show us in Scenario 1, or note-taking, as I'll talk about in Scenario 2. So let's get started. Now I'm going to talk about a scenario where we use the double entry organizer for note taking and how to effectively scaffold that for your teachers. The double entry organizer is an effective reading strategy that promotes active engagement both during and after reading and guides students to take notes, reflect on their notes, generate questions about the content, and make connections, things like that. However, in order for students to get the most impact from using it, they have to be clear on how to use it both during and after reading. So today I'm going to share some ideas with you on how to scaffold the double entry organizer so that students better understand how to use it. So let's talk about when and why you'd want to scaffold the DEO. First, if you've never used the strategy before and students aren't familiar with it, you'll want to how, model how to use it to reduce cognitive load. It's a lot easier for students to learn how to use the strategy with an accessible text. So you'll want to make sure it's not a really complex text for the first time you're teaching them this. If you're modeling and showing them how to use it, then they don't have to process the learning of the strategy at the same time they're processing the learning of the content. Likewise, what students are familiar with the strategy, if you're using a complex text, you might want to go back in and scaffold with them the use of that strategy with that more complex text. That'll be helpful to them to access and process that information. Scaffolding is especially important for our English language learners and special education students. In fact, they might even require more scaffolding or scaffolding for a longer period of time than our other students. So let's look and talk through some examples of what this might look like. Um, we want to provide students with support for the first time. So when they're using this for the first time, I would introduce the graphic organizer and explain the two columns that students are gonna put information from the text on the left and on the right is where they'll put their questions, thoughts, et cetera, in reaction to what they wrote from the text. To help students with adding information from the reader side, I might even introduce and share some possible sentence starters with them to help make connections, connect to previous learning, ask questions, or whatever it is that I want students to think about. These sentence starters can also help with using um, this tool with, for academic dialogue after they've read. You can pair it with strategies like paired verbal fluency, the block party, or it says, I say, and so, depending on your purpose. So after introducing and explaining the DEO, I can provide the scaffolding in a couple of different ways. I could give students a blank copy and project a blank copy, like you see here, then model a read aloud, think aloud, and add the information as I go. As I add information to my DEO and model, students would need to copy information onto their own double entry organizers to serve as an example that they could relate back to. Um, when I do this, I, after I add my from the reader response on the right, you can see here in blue, I can ask students to share what they might add and they could talk with a partner. As I continue to model my read aloud, think aloud, adding information from the text on the left, I could gradually release responsibility to students for adding information to the right. As teachers, you know your students best, so you can gauge when to release that responsibility to them. Another approach would be to go ahead and add the key points from the text that I want students to know and understand on the left-hand side, as you can see here on this slide. 
Then as I conduct my read aloud, think aloud, I can stop and explain why I chose to capture that specific information. The think aloud part is really important because it helps stu students better understand that why and what kinds of information you choose to write down from the text. I'll also wanna point out that I've added page numbers and paragraph numbers and how that's really important to find that textual evidence when students are going back and working with groups or discussing, it's easy to find where they wrote that down. So after I explain what I've put on the left hand side and why I chose to add that, I'll move over to the right hand side to model and explain my response, as you can see here in the blue. Um, and in this particular example, I use the sentence starter, um, I wonder. Once I've modeled adding information to both sides, as students are ready, I can have them help me add the information to the right. They can work with partners or individually to add their responses. You can see here, those are indicated in the different color font. I wanna provide sentence starters to help them who need them, but not all students will. Again, that's just another support for them. So after students get familiar with the use of the double entry organizer, I can begin to pull supports away. In doing so, maybe I only provide a few concepts from the text on the left, and then they add the rest. Maybe I model use of the tool with the first paragraph, then I have students work with a partner to read the next paragraph and capture key points from the text. Some other considerations might be to ask students to identify a specific number of concepts from the text or add a variety of different types of comments from the reader. But before having students use the tool, it's really important to think about what your purpose is and provide guidance. Once students are familiar with using the DEO, it can be modified to specify what types of information you want from the text, what types of information you want from the reader. And don't forget to continue to have students use this tool after reading to help with academic dialogue and discussion. They can use information from the left side to provide textual evidence in their discussion and information on the right side as a guide to make connections, generate questions, and so much more. Now, Roland is going to talk and share with us another way to use the Double Entry Organizer. Thanks, Jenny. Let's look at the second scenario. I used this slide with teachers the other day, and I know it's a jumbled mess, but the point was that all of our disciplines have students grappling with content, whether it's constructing viable arguments in mathematics, interpreting data in science, constructing counterclaims in social studies. We know our students have to really grapple different ways with the content. That's what the second example is going to look at, less about reading comprehension and more about a note-taking process, this idea of process analysis. Really important to start off with, what are our explicit um, expectations? Um, for this example, I really want students noticing things, because as soon as I notice something that caused an effect issue, I can begin to predict what's going to happen uh, as a result of that. Um, the, another piece of this that we're thinking about with process analysis is, how am I going to make sure I've got this process understood and I know what the steps are? And then lastly, this idea of notes to future selves. How will I know to use this process in the future when I see a problem like this? From my teaching perspective, I want to provide my students the content that I need them to have, that scaffolding that Jenny talked about in the first scenario. But it's also really important that we begin to turn over as much of the thinking to them as we can. So how do I design my instruction to do that? And then last but certainly not least, we want to think about um, what structure we can introduce to students um, for around using their notes to move, for, move their learning forward. And we'll talk a couple of different ways about this idea of um, study skills as a post-secondary success, whether it's college or career. And we know that they have to be able to take that information and use it later, helping build in that process. So let's look at this example. I would start with a double entry organizer right off the bat as part of my bell ringer routine, establishing that today's notes start now, taking full advantage of that first 20 minutes of prime learning time um, that we know the, the student's brain is ready to, to grapple with new content, um, activating prior knowledge, and really kind of setting them up for success with vocabulary. 
So they're going to do a compare and contrast today's example with um, an example from their notes from yesterday. They would go back and look at their double entry organizer from yesterday to compare these two problems. Um, you see it here in green, but they would just go back to their notes. Um, I would also have them do a quick vocabulary check. There's a couple of different ways of doing this, but have them work with their partner or small groups to identify words that we used yesterday that they think would come into play today. Um, it also might be an opportunity for me to front load some vocabulary that I know we're going to be using. So I might add it there and less about them discovering it, but more about them being able to explain what those terms might mean. So things like term, um, distributive property, um, inverse operations, any of those terms that would go along with this, I might front load that to set up the expectation. This is some of the language we're going to be using today. I can really easily see this compare and contrast establishing three different kinds of answers. One might be, I just noticed something. I don't know what to do with it, but I do notice there are parentheses in one of the examples um, and not in the other. But I also know that there are X's on both sides of both examples. That idea of, again, compare and contrast, beginning to notice they're developing that capacity. The next version might be, I noticed that, and I think we have to get rid of those parentheses so that it would look like the example we did yesterday. Because what we know is we know how to deal with that example from yesterday. That's that part of that process analysis. And then third, it might come in a couple of different ways. If your students aren't comfortable yet with the distributive property, this might be an opportunity for you to help model what that might look like. So they're going to notice it. And then we might admit immediately process inside of a process, simplify it here on the right hand side. Um, so that they can use that information. I always try to have students think about it both procedurally and conceptually so they can really build their understanding of these new processes. Multiple ways of doing something is not a bad thing. So it's important to recognize that the notation on the left-hand side of this double entry organizer is very intentional. This is a chance for me to model um, not only the language I'm going to be using, but the structure I want the students to be capturing uh, on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side is their thinking. We want to be very careful here. We know that it takes time on the left-hand side to get that problem worked out. But if we want them to think and we want them to write, we have to build in extra time to do that. It can't just be the same thing we've always done. We've got to build in those very intentional pauses. And so one of the things we can do here is slow it down. We've already done that with the first pause. The bell ringer really is our first pause, accessing their prior knowledge, getting them to bring something to the table, talking about it. It's really important that we also think about um, if we go back to this step right here and we let all students do this individually, think about the discrepancy of knowledge between that first person and potentially that third person. Um, by having students do some individual time, work time, but then in pairs or small groups talking about it, we've now leveled the playing field to move the learning forward. So now when we get back to this pause, I think the second pause could come right away. What's the next step we're going to do? Either again, in pairs or small groups, have students talk about it. In this case, we're subtracting 2x from both sides. A lot of early algebra or eighth grade students will subtract 3x's from both sides to get the x's on the left-hand side. That's a perfectly valid approach. Um, it's great counter conversation at the end to think about which process would be more efficient and why. Um, the third pause might come right away, but I think in the flow of the work, that'll happen pretty quickly. So I think the third pause for me would happen here. Okay, so we've got an answer. Does our answer make sense? And how do we know it makes sense? Really getting students to think about not just can I replicate a problem, but once I've got an answer, does that answer make sense? All right, Roland. So let's talk about the double entry organizer a little bit. Yeah. So Jenny, I really appreciated when you got started with yours, you were talking about the different ways of scaffolding the, the strategy. And I really appreciated it. A lot of times we think about scaffolding a strategy when it's the first time students or the first couple of times students are seeing the, the, the strategy. But I really liked in yours that you talk about when students are grappling with a complex text, it still is the value of having some scaffolding to go in there. So it's less about the process, but more about the content. Can you talk to me a little bit about how um, that scaffolding might be this similar or different um, for, for the, that purpose? Sure, Roland. So we know that um, sometimes it's scary for teachers to provide students with texts that are grade level texts if they're not reading on grade level. Um, so providing the double entry organizer and scaffolding that and modeling with them is really helpful for them to better understand how to navigate that text that's a little more complex for them. 
Um, being able to chunk the text is really important. Maybe the teacher reads a paragraph aloud to them, adds information to the left-hand side to help students better comprehend what's going on in that passage. And if students are able, they let the students go ahead and do the right-hand side because they know that process. So maybe the teacher does that for a paragraph or two, and then steps back, releases the responsibility for the students to do the next paragraph to see how they're doing with that. Um, and if students are able to do it, then let them go do the work on their own. But in the, if the teacher still has some students who may be struggling with the text and understanding it because of the complexity of the vocabulary or maybe the way the text is organized, then the teacher might continue to provide some support and scaffolding to, to those students that still need it, um, differentiating for them based on their needs. That's helpful because students who are able to read the text and understand it, they can go on and do the work, but the students who still need that modeling or support have that from the teacher. So I think I heard you say before also that, um, doing one together with them, but then when you release them, maybe not releasing them individually, but letting them work in partners or in small groups to work through the reading. Again, when you, you talk about this idea of, of text being, if, whether it's a technical, technically written, um, the vocabulary, the, the features, all of those kinds of things can add to the complexity that students have to deal with. I, I have not really thought about it that way, but I appreciate the fact that um, scaffolding is to introduce the process, but it also can help scaffolding the content. And I, I think that's worth um, exploring. So thank that's you. Right. Yeah. So, so Roland, in your approach, I thought it was really interesting. I had never seen the double entry organizer used in this way. Um, and there were a couple of pieces about it that I thought were really interesting that I'd like to know a little more about, um, because I think it would be really helpful for teachers and students in processing um, the information. So the two pieces I really want to know a little more about is that connection to previous learning and how you can pull in the vocabulary and focus on vocabulary a little more, because I think that's an area where teachers really struggle. Yeah, so we know that study skills are, again, those post-secondary success skills. We know that students, um, whether they're going to go into college or career, they need to be able to uh, keep track of information and revisit that information. And when you talk to a seventh grader or a sophomore in high school and you say study harder, what does that mean? So a lot of times we take notes, but students don't know how to read them, right? They don't know how to utilize them. Reading through them can be a misnomer, right? So I'm really good at and read can read through my notes, but I'm only really capturing a little bit of the of the con of the content. So it's we need to give them purposes for going back and ways of utilizing that. So again, in a math class, it's pretty easy. We might have an example from the previous day, um, and we might have an example that we're going to do today, and having them do something like a compare and contrast. That's a that's a really simple thing. And then once we know the process that we used, um, and we've got them looking similar, we can apply that same process of going back and making that process valuable. But that compare and contrast can be with any content. It doesn't have to be math. It can be in a science class or a social studies class, but really thinking about what are some of those key questions that you want students to be able to grapple with. So in a social studies class, if you're taking notes on this left-hand side, one of my favorite things to do is to have students um, think about what's a question you think I, as the teacher, would ask you um, about this content. What's great about that is now they're answering the question and not just reading through their notes. So that idea of different ways of interacting with the content. But that means I have to plan That's to right. be able to revisit, right? So I need to know that today's content connects back to yesterday's content or two days ago's content, and I have to have that connection explicit for them. So let's talk about a couple of things in classes. We know this, that uh, students won't always remember to bring their notes with them. So if I plan a lesson and the notes aren't there, then how am I going to deal with that? Well, teachers are uh, know that their students are this way, so maybe they keep the notes in the classroom in a folder. They keep their, their um, uh, notebooks in the classroom so those students go and get those notebooks. That way the, the content is there. If the students don't have that content or they weren't there that day, they just work with a partner or they work in their small groups to figure that out. That's not a, a hard thing to do. I really appreciate the idea of vocabulary. And I think that's one of the things that this can really do. When I go back and I look at the notes, I may not have written down all that vocabulary, 
But if I'm talking with my partner about what's some of the words that we use when we were doing this, I'm accessing that prior knowledge, I'm firing those neurons, I'm getting them to think about the vocabulary that at least they heard me saying, um, but they can also think about the vocabulary that they may have captured in their notes. So thinking about what are some of the new words we have. So I mentioned that, that idea of if your students aren't familiar with the distributive property or they, they're not they're not, they don't have the distributive property mastered, making sure that maybe you add that word there and say, hey, this is one of the terms I'm going to expect you to use today. So it's a little bit of me front loading and a little bit of them accessing their prior knowledge. And then during the lesson, being very intentional about using that language and, and calling them back to that language. Those are great ideas. Uh, I'm hearing you talk about maybe students losing notes, not bringing them to class. Makes me think that some teachers might even have electronic versions of the double entry organizer so that students always have access to them as long as they have a device. Yeah, yeah that's a great uh, that's a great point. So with, with the technology, we could easily take a picture of somebody's notes or have my own version of the notes already made. So that's a great way of getting students um, caught up quickly with the notes. I love that idea. In fact, I hadn't really thought well, about that's, it. Well, that's what you did in your slides. Yeah. You had done so, it and taken some pictures. So the purpose of this video was to really kind of take a deep, dark, deep, dark, a deep look at the double entry organizer and give you a couple of different ways of thinking about how you use it. We hope you've enjoyed the video and we look forward to seeing you at our next video series.